Okay, uh, afternoon everyone. Um, I'm from England, so I apologize if I talk too quickly. Um, just wave your arms around if I'm going too fast. Um, this is a 45 minute talk and I've given it in English and it takes 45 minutes um, at, like, at speed. So um, I'll try and get through it all, um, but I potentially might run into a bit of Q&A time. So if we don't get that, then just come and grab me at any point and I'm happy to talk through everything with you guys. Um, so, I'm Ryan Townsend, um, I run a, a tech company uh, called Shift in the north of England. Um, we are an enterprise scale e-commerce platform, so you've probably heard of things like Shopify. Um, we're kind of like that, but aimed at much larger scale businesses. Um, so, this is one of my uh, larger clients, a company called Matalan. Um, they're a high street retailer in the UK. They have over 200 physical stores and they do over a billion a year in revenue. Um, so I bet you can imagine that web performance is a pretty big deal for them. You know, every second matters. You know, they can improve conversion, improve um, basket values and all that kind of stuff um, if they have a faster website. So it's really important for all of my clients and that's kind of how I got into this. Um, so a little agenda for the talk today. Um, we're going to start off just talking about what are third parties, because there may be people in the room who just don't know what they are. Um, you know, cover off why they're po problematic, you know, what problems kind of occur with them, what do you have to watch out for. And if they're so problematic, why use them at all? And then finally, the kind of crux of the talk is what can we do to mitigate against those problems? What can we do to limit the impact that they cause? So, what are third parties? In my view, they are services and infrastructure that power our websites that we don't actually own or have a significant deal of control over. So I kind of exclude things like CDNs or image transformation from that um, because those services are kind of like the utilities, the, the kind of plumbing of the web these days. Um, these are more services like A-B testing tools or personalization or analytics, that kind of stuff. Um, where usually you're dropping a script on your site and you don't really know how it all works, but it just magically does and you're trusting those third parties to, to manage that for you. So why is this a problem? Um, when I was writing this talk, um, I didn't want to just rehash what everyone's already said uh, before me, so I started looking through previous talks um, and if you go all the way back to Velocity Conference back in 2011, um, there was a presentation by Google about third parties, and back then they were saying, the web is slow. The average website takes 4.9 seconds to load. It has a whole 44 resources to build a, a page. You know, over 0.3 megabytes of data to build a web page. And thankfully, you know, Google are a fairly well-known company. So the, the web lived happily ever after. Everyone made their websites faster except they didn't, and that's why we're all here today. Um, a quick show of hands. Um, these are a whole bunch of different categories of, of third parties. So we've got things like web fonts, live chat, we've got adverts, tag managers, analytics, videos, etc. How many of you have got three or more of these on, on your sites or your clients' websites? Like everyone in the room, right? Five or more? Yeah, a lot of hands. Okay, so all of these problems are going to be multiplied up by at least five um, for, for your websites. Um, I was at um, Performance Now conference uh, last November, um, and Steve Souders gave a talk where he looked at the growth of JavaScript on the web um, over the past few years. And again, looking back to 2011, we can see that the majority of this growth in the number of um, scripts that we're including has come from third parties. Yes, we've added to like 50% onto our, onto our first party scripts, but we've over doubled the, um, the volume of third party JavaScript. If we look at just e-commerce as an industry, so very applicable to my clients, um, Yotta did a study um, and in 2015 they had 15 third parties. It's now, last year was up to 85. And the trouble that we have with this is that everyone's saying, can I bring a plus one to the party? Um, you include just one script and then they bring in other people and more, you know, and, and all these different uh, third parties come along, so you end up with fourth and fifth and sixth parties, and it all gets a bit out of hand. 
to kind of illustrate this, there's a tool called Request Map. Um, it's just on the web. There's a URL in the corner. All these slides will be online afterwards. Well, they already are. Um, so don't worry if you can't quite see the URL. Um, but what you can do is throw a, a, a URL into the tool, and it will generate a diagram like this. And it runs a web page test and then analyzes, OK, this JavaScript loads this JavaScript that loads this JavaScript. So at the bottom, you can see the big blue circle. That's the main website. And you can see most things are kind of directly related to that. So you've got images loading in and things like that. But then you've got this other blue one in the kind of middle. And then that loads off these like purple and yellow ones. And then it all it just gets uh, wider and wider, this diagram. But it's not just the volume of scripts that we're using as well. It's actually down to the implementation. One of my um, clients was doing a bit of um, vendor selection. They were choosing a tool um, to, to include on their website. So they got me in, in touch with this third party and said, OK, can, can you judge them, them from a performance perspective? You know, we want to make sure that they're not going to have a negative impact on our website. And this is what they said. They said, there is zero overhead, nothing. Um, you just put our synchronous script on your site you know, th that blocks the actual browser from doing anything. Um, and yeah, typical response time is 200 milliseconds. So I said, well, which is it? Is it zero or is it 200 milliseconds? <laughs> like, it, there's a lot of knowledge that's, that's lost on these third parties. So this is why it's really important that we do what we can to, um, to, to improve the situation. And it's not even just the actual implementation as well. The, the, there's the volume of scripts, and there's also the size of scripts. So again, we've seen that our first party JavaScript has doubled. <laughs> But the third-party JavaScript has actually um, increased by eight times in the same period. Um, so we're, look, we're downloading a lot more onto our, our users' devices. And it's not even just the network as well. So once we've got all of this JavaScript, it's not as simple as just, oh, great, now it's all there. We've then got to actually execute the JavaScript as well. Um, so this is a web page test result. So it's a, a waterfall showing how a web page loaded. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Um, if you look at the little pink bars, that's JavaScript executing on the main thread. And there's a block there that's of one second where that, that single script was just executing and nothing else could happen for one whole second. No one could tap on icons and open burger menus and do anything like that. This was just on an average device. It's not even a slow device. Um, so we, you know, the, we can actually have an impact on the actual runtime of our websites as well. In fact, it's so bad that Patrick Hulse of the Lighthouse project, the, the audits that are built into, into Chrome, um, showed that in his study, third-party script execution is the majority of the web today. That's what you, the, the most of your time your browser is actually downloading and executing JavaScript. And the average per third party is 225 milliseconds. Now, that doesn't sound too bad. It's like, well, 0.2 seconds, that's pretty instant. Um, but when you have 85 of them, that's 19 seconds where someone can't actually interact with a device. It's a long time. Um, so this is really, really bad for, for both our visitors. But they're not the only ones who are affected by this. Like, they're the most important people because they're, they're the ones that we're here to serve. It's really important that you know, we, we um, have our sites as fast as possible so that they have a good experience. But it also presents a challenge to ourselves as well and our businesses. First of all, you're going to have an inaccurate development experience. Your machine's probably not configured the same as production, because production will have all these tag managers doing all of these things with analytics and everything like that. They'll have A-B tests running, whereas your machine probably doesn't have half of that. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a single business where their development machines, their staging environments, and production all exactly match. Uh, most people would love that to be the case, but it just doesn't happen. So that means that things like QA are really hard. You know, you're, you're like, why isn't this working? You know, we're getting alerts going off in production. Everything looks fine on my machine. Um, you know, you're going to have that inaccurate experience. We also can't perform any linting and um, pre-commit hooks on this because ultimately it's third-party content. So we can't have something that blocks us from committing that bad third-party in or you know doing things like performance budgets because ultimately the JavaScript that gets pulled in is going to vary depending on what they've rolled out at any one time. And then finally, we're putting the governance of these systems in the hands of these third parties. They could roll out an update at any time. Some, like, some tools have controls over this, 
But the majority of scripts that are just chucked in, uh, you don't control when they get updated. They just happen at any time. Um, so effectively, you know, there's a lot of big organizations that I deal with who have things like change boards, and they move very slowly, and they sign off every little thing that gets changed. But then they have all these third parties that just bypass that whole process, and they just have to hope that they know what they're doing. So if everything's so bad, why should we use them? And I don't really want to be too negative about, <laughs> about third parties. Um, in fact, um, back in it was April, um, I was at Perth Matters, a Stell's conference, um, and she made these amazing mugs for all the speakers um, with much more attractive versions of ourselves on them. Um, but the, the fun bit was on the back. So Estelle had written on mine, a fan of parties but not third parties. Um, and <laughs> this is somewhat true, um, but um, re realistically, a party isn't very fun if you're the only person there. Um, so there are, there are valid reasons for us to want other people to be involved. So the first of all is that you just can't build everything yourself. You're going to have your time, the cost of building things. Um, you might not have the expertise or your team might not have the expertise. Um, so you just simply can't build everything yourself. And even if you can build something, there's always the question of whether you should build something. Um, I, I've dealt with a client who was once considering building out their own content delivery network because they didn't want to pay Fastly or Cloudflare um, a bunch of money. And I was like, well, are you going to build that into an actual product? You know, are you going to put a team on that forevermore and maintain your own content delivery network and compete with them? Because otherwise, you're just going to get behind the curve. You're going to, you know, you, like look at the rollout of things like HTTP2 and now HTTP3. If you're maintaining that yourself, then you're going to have to do all of that yourself. Whereas if you go to Fastly and Cloudflare, then they can do that for you. Um, so you've always got a question like, should you be building this tool? You might be hacking around technical limitations. Um, so things like your CMS or your e-commerce platform. Hopefully not if you're using Shift, because we've designed it not to be too limiting. Um, or you might be using things like a static site, where you can't do certain dynamic functionality. Um, so you might need a third party um, to, to inject some functionality on your site just to work around that limitation. And you also have organizational limitations as well. So this might be things like, um, you know, things that you have to do uh, regarding the law. Um, so you might have to have things that track certain behaviors on your site. It could be things like fraud tracking. You know, if you've got a payment gateway, um, things like Stripe put a script on every page just so they can track behavior and they know whether someone's doing something dodgy or not. Um, so there's, there's a lot of valid reasons to, to be using these. So if we agree that we just, you know, there are plenty of cases where we have to use them, what can we actually do um, to, to kind of uh, start working on this? Um, well, the first thing to do is look at identifying what you have on your site already. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because there is some amazing talks on this already, and I've got them on a slide, so I'll show you that in a second. Um, but if we just go back to that request map, you can see these third parties that are going off and loading loads more, and they're quite large. The actual size of the, the circle means that they're downloading more content. Um, so those are good ones to identify, and with that tool, you can just hover over, and it'll show you who they are. Um, you can also run um, a web page test. Um, and look for things like long-running JavaScript, so there's, there's pink blocks, um, and also large payloads. So there's, there's wider um, downloads in terms of the actual little uh, bar at the bottom. Um, what you can also do is directly within Chrome, if you open your developer tools, um, this is a little slower than I talk, so I have to kind of go a bit slower. Um, if you go into the performance tab and then click the little reload button, it, does, it reloads the page and profiles it. Um, and then once that's executed, I think it just takes a few seconds. You can then go to bottom up at the bottom here. Um, and that'll look at all the different domains. Um, and you can group by the domain if it's not already selected just there. And then you can literally look down the list and see who contributed the most time to the CPU. Um, and then just um, start working on those ones at the top of the list. So I mentioned those um, talks. Um, these are the ones that you'll want to go and have a look at. So I'm not going to delve too more deeply into actually looking at what third parties you do have. Because uh, as I say, the crux of this talk is like, what can we do to start mitigating this? Um, so the first thing to do is look at how are you actually loading these. Um, this, we can go into a lot of detail here. Um, first of all, 
when and where do you actually need to load this script? Um, there's a lot of times when people just dump scripts on every single page, um, but you don't actually have to have that case. You can, you can load conditionally based on different devices. It might be something that you only have on desktop. Um, it could be something that only gets loaded on fast connections. Um, it could be on certain pages or sections of your site. So just really consider that and try and minimize where those scripts exist. Um, it could also be triggered on user behavior. Um, so it, one of my clients um, implemented a new uh, review system. Um, so they were pulling in customer reviews onto their website. And they were loading this script on every single page. And it happened whether or not someone was interested in reading the reviews. We already had the count of the reviews and the number of stars in the platform. So we could show all that information, but we just couldn't, we didn't have access to the actual um, content of those reviews. But this was happening on every single page. And it was quite heavy. And this is a fairly slow device, but it was using eight seconds of, of blocking JavaScript on the CPU just to load in some, um, load in some reviews. So all we did to, to uh, help them fix this was just switched it over so that when someone clicks on the reviews tab, it then loads the reviews. Simple as that. Um, so this chopped off eight seconds um, and had an immense impact on conversion. Next thing to look at is how critical is this resource? I mentioned, do we need to load it on every device? It could be that you say, OK, well, on slow connections, we don't want to give no experience. We want to give a experience. So we'll load in, um, a, uh, we'll load in a given script if we have a nice, powerful connection. But otherwise, we'd rather they just have the, the base content. You know, we don't need to show them how many people bought this item in the past 10 minutes. We're just going to show them the item. Um, so really questioning how critical things are is really important. It's almost like we've had this concept of progressive enhancement um, for first-party JavaScript since the early days of standardizing the web. Um, but it's not really ever applied to third parties. Everyone just kind of throws things on and, and just assumes that in any context, we should always have that JavaScript there. So it's worthwhile considering that for third parties as well. The next thing to look at is, do we need all of it? This is a, an output, again, from uh, Chrome DevTools. Uh, this is the coverage report. So what you can do, I think the, um, there's a shortcut for this. Uh, if you hit Command-Shift-P, it'll bring up a little autocomplete, and you just type coverage, and it'll allow you to run this report. Um, so this looks at all the different scripts. It does CSS and everything as well. And it will show you how much of that script has actually been used versus how much has just been wasted. It's been downloaded, but never executed by the browser. So we can start to look down these files and actually, for this given page, there was 860 kilobytes of, of JavaScript that was downloaded that was never executed. So there's a lot of wastage in there. And then there's some like, obvious things that we can look at as well. So we can check things like, are we actually compressing these files? Can we subset our fonts? You know, If we're only using Latin characters and we don't have all the accents on a given page, can we just pull in the characters that we actually need from that font file? Um, can we centralize all of our data capture? You know, I've seen sites that have 10 different analytics platforms running on them. And you say, OK, well, can we just have one that then pushes all that data out to them? Um, and then finally, there's things like jQuery, where everyone's saying, oh, you know, we need jQuery for our third party. We use version 1.236. And then you've got another third party saying, oh, we use 2.47. And then so everyone ends up bringing their own jQuery with them. Um, so often, the, a lot of tools will now have options to say, OK, I'm just going to assume that this, is, this library is already loaded. So you load it first party for them. And then they, can, they don't have to load it as well. They can just use the version that your website provides. Um, another thing in terms of this, the size of data um, that we're, we're downloading and whether we need it all, um, this was a, a case where one of my clients had a personalization tool. So this is where, as you browse around their website, um, it tries to build an image of who you are and recommend products based on what you're interested in. So it goes, ah, oh, okay, you've browsed this category, you've viewed this product, so you've shown affinities to certain things. Um, and then it says, okay, you might like suits. Um, I don't think this was particularly accurate. Um, I don't think it really goes with a baseball cap, but okay. Um, so, but the interesting thing here was the fact that this um, third party was passing the full size zoomed in uh, like photographic quality image and using that for a little carousel. So these images were displayed as about this big, but the image was massive. So that each one of these was over a megabyte in terms of the actual size of the image. 
Um, so obviously all the alarm bells go off and we have to, to help them fix this. But um, this, is, this is really important and it's, it, it's worthwhile looking at um, things like A-B tests as well. When you, when you do these things, a lot of the time people will say, okay, I want to swap this image for an A-B test. Well, if you put an enormous image on that page, that's going to skew the results of your A-B test because it might mean the page loads really slow for the A version and then really fast for the B version. And obviously, you don't know whether that's going to be accurate in terms of the, the actual stats that you get out the back of it. Another thing to look at is avoiding any technical debt. So these are things like 100% tests. So in, in A-B testing platforms, I've seen it many times when clients are saying, OK, we've um, we found a, a, an uplift. Um, you know, we've changed the colors um, to, to blue buttons. Um, and now we want to roll that out to the site. But the dev team is saying, oh, sorry, we're really busy. So they just crank it up to 100% because they don't want to lose the money. They've proven that it makes them more money. So they just leave it 100% and say, OK, well, we'll just we'll just do that until the dev team get around to it. But then that means that JavaScript has to execute for every single person, even though all they're doing is something as simple as changing some colors. Another thing to look at is, is things like unused third parties. You might have been using a script at one time, and then nowadays you're not. You know, the license was revoked or whatever it may be, but you've just left that script on there. So it's worthwhile checking for those. And the final thing to kind of reduce the... Um, the size of these is to actually optimize the third-party scripts themselves. Now, there's few cases where you actually have access to do this. Anytime you're able to actually go behind the scenes and see some code that's been configured in those tools, obviously you can't go away and change their actual core business. Um, but things like tag managers, sometimes you know you'll go nice user interface and click some buttons. And behind the scenes, that's generating some JavaScript code that can execute. And often you can go in and actually tailor that JavaScript. Same thing with A/B tests. You'll get um, designers who will click around a nice what you see is what you get editor. But anyone who's ever used Dreamweaver knows that when you do that, you get mess out of the back. Um, so it's worthwhile going into those tests and actually seeing can we optimize that JavaScript in there as well. And to give a real world example, this is the time around we improved that, um, that review system. So you can see the nice little drop at the start and the little gray line. And then a couple of days later, maybe even one day later, um, the client rolled out an A-B test that absolutely decimated JavaScript performance. So all that good work that went into optimizing the, the review system was ov undone overnight um, just by an, an a, a single A-B test that caused this. Um, so it really can have a huge impact. And this might be already running, and then you can, you can look at what that A-B test is doing and maybe replicate it in a more optimized fashion. Another thing to look at in terms of... Um, our loading process is how we actually load it. Um, so a lot of scripts, particularly um, A-B tests, say you've got to put in a synchronous tag. That's going to create a single point of failure. It's going to block the, the, the browser from really doing anything at all. Um, so you need to be really critical around, can you load something asynchronously, or can you even look like defer it until the end of the page load? Um, we did this with a single script. Um, on one of our clients' websites, and the impact on the start render times and the first contentful paint and first meaningful paint um, was immense. We chopped off multiple seconds so people could see things on their device far sooner. And the trouble that uh, like, this was a, a real battle to get over the over the finish line um, because we had questions like this: What about the flicker? You know, people are going to see version A, and then suddenly it's going to be version B. Um, and there's a lot of practical things that we could talk about with that. Um, so there's things like, well, a lot of the tests that we're doing were in their navigation, and on, on things like mobile, on these slower devices where you see, you're more likely to see that, that script load later. Um, that was all hidden behind the burger menu anyway, so no one would ever see the site adjust. Um, a lot of what was, they were testing was beneath the fold, so people would never see it anyway. Um, but there was still a chance, you know, if you're on a really slow connection, it could be 10 seconds later and something could adjust, and that, that could be a problem. Um, so what we looked at for that stuff was, was using a curfew, you know, stopping something at a certain point. Um, and there's a few tools that we have access to already. There's things like font display. When you come into using fonts, you can just simply say, yeah, um, we're going we're gonna to set this font, so if it doesn't load after a few seconds, just don't load it and fall back to the original. You know, use a native one that's built into the browser. Um, but there's, it doesn't really go much further than fonts. Um, we've not really rolled this out. There's no timeout attribute on a script tag, for example. Um, so there's a few little tricks that we can, we can do for this. 
Um, for, for adverts, they're particularly tricky. Um, you need to do real-time bidding and figure out which adverts needs to be displayed. Um, so looking into this one, we found a technique where um, effectively we can cut off the rendering time and effectively have a timeout um, before the script um, may have loaded. So this is an example where a, a, a little website is loading fairly fast. It's taking 700 milliseconds or so. So that script's running nice and fast. But the trouble is, um, when it's slow, this blocks the browser. This is a blocking script. So therefore, it waits five seconds before the page can even be seen. Your advert and your content will be displayed. Um, but what we figured out we could do is say, OK, well, if it, we'll give it two seconds. And after that point, we're just going to show the page. It might not have adverts on it. But then the adverts can load in afterwards. So most people get the advert and the content at the same time. But we're not just preventing people from seeing the website if our adverts are just really slow. Um, and so this was a fairly simple technique that we used. Um, all we had to do, and I haven't tested the accessibility of this particular example bit of code, so don't just copy and paste this. There was a lot more work that went into it. Um, but effectively, we hide the body, um, load the script asynchronously, so that allows the browsers to continue doing other things. And then when that script loads in, we then show the body because we know that the adverts will have, have loaded in. Um, if there's any error, so if someone's blocked that script, then we show the body immediately. Um, and if a timeout occurs, at this time it's set to three seconds, um, we will always show the body. So that way, no matter whether those adverts load or not, people aren't being blocked from the website. So showing them something is better than nothing. They're going to get a good experience on the website and hopefully come back and view more ads in future. <laughs> um, not that that was the, why they were there. Um, another way to, to do this, and this only works on your second page view, um, is to set a timeout. Now, the trouble, as I mentioned, scripts don't have a timeout attribute. Um, so there's no way natively to, to easily add this. Um, but we've now got the power of um, service workers. So this page has got a, um, a script tag in there that takes five seconds to load. But then we use a service worker, which after uh, one second will respond with a, a synthetic response that just says, this is just not going to load. So this is perfect for things like A-B tests, where you say, you know what, after three seconds, if that script hasn't loaded, we're just not going to try testing this user. We're just going to leave them untested. Um, so this is something that we put in place with the previous thing where we didn't want to rejig the page 10 seconds after it had loaded. We just want to chop it off and say, look, we're not even going to bother testing this user. And again, this is fairly simple code. Um, so this is just a service worker file. It's just a few lines of JavaScript. So we test that a given request includes that URL. Um, and then we race a timeout of two seconds against that request. Whichever happens first, we use. Um, so if the request comes back in a few hundred milliseconds, as the, is the average case, great, things are performing well, the user's on a nice fast connection, then we will use that. If it's um, someone on a slow connection or if that third party is having an outage and things are going really slow, we don't grind the whole website to a halt. So they still get that experience. <coughs> Our penultimate um, tip is just looking at whether you can host these resources yourself. So doing things like proxying. Um, it's quite a tricky one. Most third parties don't want you to do this because th they want to control their own service to a certain degree. But there's a lot of benefits you can get from this. So you don't have to do a DNS lookup because you're serving things from your own domain. You don't have to do an extra connection. You don't have to negotiate SSL. So all of that can be multiple hundreds of milliseconds on, on slow devices. Um, you get better HTTP2 prioritization. I put that in quotes just because it's pretty broken at the moment. Um, if you look up um, talks by people like Pat Meenan, they kind of explain why, but it is better than having a third party. Um, you can use fingerprinting, so you can tell devices, yep, this is now changed, so only download it when the actual contents of that script have changed. A lot of time with third-party scripts, they'll just go, okay, we'll set a timeout of 10 seconds on this so that every 10 seconds it pulls down the new version in the hopes that maybe it might have changed. Um, but we're wasting a lot of data and, and, and reducing um, performance that way. And then finally, you, because you're controlling that yourself, you can control your content security policies a little better. But you just have to be mindful that you are serving someone else's JavaScript from your first party. So that's something to bear in mind. So I mentioned things like changes. You know, a lot of these providers will set, say, a 10-second um, timeout. 
The easy solution to that is to use a proxy solution. So Cloudflare have got a whole blog post on doing this with Google Fonts. Um, so literally, they just pass the request through your uh, content delivery network and proxy it out to Google and then respond um, to that request with, with whatever Google responded to. So you don't really have to worry about changing anything. Um, but one of these solutions that um, we came up with um, for one of our clients doing personalization um, was that we would have this dual phase loading. So we would pull in a script that would say, okay, we're gonna use this part of the page and this part of the page, and that will get embedded on the, in the HTML. So we'd say, prepare these areas to have stuff put in them. Um, and then they would load in the, the, the regular script asynchronously. Um, and actually, Casper Beds have um, implemented this um, themselves. And they did this for Optimizely. There's a Medium blog post for this. And you can see they had a massive impact on their render times. They shaved off 1.7 seconds, which for a, for a business of their size is pretty impressive. And they've got a great diagram in there that kind of explains how they do this. I won't go into too much detail, but they just have a schedule um, that runs in Lambda, pulls in the script from Optimizely and dumps it into an S3 bucket. And then effectively their visitors um, are shown that file from their own origin through the proxy of their CDM um, without having to go away to, to Optimizely every single time. So it's a fairly simple solution. And the final point in terms of our loading strategy is just looking at whether we can pre-connect or preload. Um, so hands up if you've heard of resource hints. Okay, a few hands. Um, so there's a few hints that you can give to a browser because the trouble with um, third parties is that they will go away and load other resources, but you don't know what they're going to be. The browser can't know about them until that third party says, okay, yeah, I do need jQuery, you need to go away and get it. Um, until the browser is instructed on that, they, they're not, the browser itself isn't aware, so it can't start downloading that. So that's how you end up with these waterfalls that just get staggered like that. Um, and they just continue across, because one thing's loading another thing, another thing, but they can't be parallelized because the, the browser can't see into the future effectively. So resource hints are a way to do that. Um, there's roughly five of them. Um, you can do things like DNS prefetching, so saying, look, I know we're going to be connecting to this domain, um, so look up the DNS for it. Um, you can do pre-connect, which is kind of like the follow-on from that, which is to say, we're going to be connecting to it over HTTPS or HTTP or whatever protocol, so go away and connect now. So that way, at least the connection's there sat ready to be used. You've got preloading, which can go in and actually download the file. Um, so if you know you're always pulling in a certain version of jQuery or something like that, you can immediately pull that in. You can do prefetching, which is just like, like the lower priority version of a preload, which waits for the browser to be idle. Um, and then pre-render, which doesn't actually render in Chrome. Um, what it does is it downloads the, the next page that you tell it to, and then it will look into that page and say, okay, what other resources do I need for that page? So I need some more JavaScript, I need some more CSS and images and things like that. And we use this quite heavily. Um, so to look at another uh, web page test, you can see um, request number five was actually a really late request, but we've told the browser up front, hey, we're gonna need this file, so go away and download it. It's really important to bump that up. Um, request number nine in the, in the kind of um, top third there, um, you can see that the, the DNS, the connection, and the SSL are kind of separated from the actual download, and that's because we're saying, look, we're gonna be connecting to this host to download some images, so just go away and do the connection now, and then as soon as you discover that first resource, you're already gonna have an open connection to use. And then right at the bottom, you can see this is again, exactly the same thing. We know we're gonna be pulling in Google Analytics, so connect to it now, and then as soon as um, we need to actually download that file, it's gonna be sat there waiting. That connection's gonna be already open, and we don't have a few hundred milliseconds of delay there. Um, so you can tell browsers up front um, you know, what's gonna be downloaded. Um, if you can't do anything technical, there are some kind of more cultural things, um, and these can be quite challenging um, because it means going and talking to things, people like in, in marketing and sales, and I know people don't really like to leave their little bubble of tech. Um, but one thing you can do is choose your friends. You know, who, which third parties are we actually going to use? So you may not want to take the, the toys away from someone saying, you can't do A-B testing anymore because it's bad for performance. But what you can say is, you know what, how about we use this provider instead? So I'm not going to take anything away. You might have to maybe do a bit of training on how to use the new tool, but they can achieve the same thing just with someone else. Um, 
I've seen a lot of situations, like the uh, example I gave earlier, where these third parties are kind of showing themselves off to be suave and really professional. And then you get them installed on your site, and they look a little more like this. You know, one guy's lost a tooth. This baby's come out of nowhere. He looks like he's about to kill himself. Um, you know, I want the people like this in my party. You know, the real nerds who know what they're doing. Um, so just in case you're kind of starting to worry about the, the, the uh, third parties that you do have on your site, um, there, there is a little bit of... Um, a, a little bit of um, tooling that can really help you kind of get that panic under control. Um, there's a great little site called JS Manners, um, which allows you to kind of review and rate your third parties. Um, so if you just fill in this form, it will tell you are they bad or are they good, basically. Um, so you may be panicking right now, but all you've got to do is run this little Q&A, and hopefully that'll put you at ease. Um, but again, if we can't change the third parties, we can't control how they load, um, one thing that we should be trying to do is just protect our site as much as possible. So we can't improve the performance necessarily. Um, we can't change the tool to something that's faster. But we can try and protect ourselves because, you know, as some, the, the example was earlier, it was an average case. So, oh, yeah, we respond in 200 milliseconds on average. Well, what happens during an outage? Are you going to down my site? Um, and one thing that we do um, at Shift is we want to get everyone out. We want to stop... Um, that third party from affecting our website. So what we look for is a kill switch. Um, we use just environment variables, so they're just either a zero or one, and that just toggles a script on and off. You can use things like your tag manager just to you know, take a script out. Um, there's also some kind of more um, browser-specific features. So there's um, a new header, uh, or relatively new, called feature policy. And this is a really cool header because you can actually restrict what features a website or a third party has access to. Um, so you can say things like, don't want you to be able to do synchronous um, Ajax calls. Um, you can't use document write. Um, you can't, you know, you must have lazy loading on there. You can't have um, too badly unoptimized images. Um, so this would block things like that carousel of 10 megabytes of images just showing me irrelevant products. Um, you know, we can actually control this in the browser, and then that way you, you're more likely to catch these things during QA. Um, and if something does happen on the website that means these things occur, it's just going to be blocked from the user. So you might get a user report saying none of these images are loading, but at least then you can actually respond to that, and you're not subtly lowering the performance for all your customers. But it's not just about protecting your site from the third parties. You've got to protect it from your own company as well. Um, and this is, the majority of these problems come from tag managers, and I'm sad to say that it's all our fault, because um, we've allowed tag managers to exist. Um, so I think the prime reason um, for tag managers existing is just because we're busy, right? You know, we, someone comes to us and says, oh, can you put this tag on, on the website for me? And we're like, ooh. Yeah, it's going to be another month until we get another release out. Um, so it's really important that if we maintain a clear release runway and we can get these things embedded on our site really quickly, um, you know, we don't have to rely so heavily on tag managers. And then we, we control that experience. We know, OK, well, when they give me this code to embed, I know what the performance impact of that's going to be, and I know how to protect against it. Um, so. In terms of that initial process of getting the scripts on there, that's one way that we can try and control that a little more. Um, we should also be looking into those tag managers and saying, is there anything that's lived in there for years? You know, someone got, got it on, like put it in there just to get it on the site really quickly, but now I'm sat around doing nothing and I want to get some, um, you know, I want to get some work, it, work done. Well, how about we migrate those things that have just been in there forever into the live site, into the actual code base? Um, and then, this is very rare. There's not many companies um, I see doing this, but if you can use server-side tag manager management, then that'll be great, because again, you're not loading another third party. Um, one of the British retailers, um, a company called Shoe, um, who sell shoes, um, I don't know whether they might be German because of the shoe name, but I'm not sure. Um, they, they actually have two tag managers. And when I first looked at this, I was like, oh, this is weird. Why are they doubling this up? But they had a very good reason for doing it. And what they do is they have one at the top, like in the head tag of their, of their HTML, and they say, OK, this is where the really important stuff goes in. And then they have one at the bottom of their HTML that's all deferred and is the last thing that's loaded. And people can basically, in their business, 
putting the low priority stuff in there. So things like tracking pixels and all that kind of stuff when you're um, doing remarketing and things like that. So their non-critical um, scripts can just be dumped in there. So that way, they have a degree of control for one tag manager and a more stringent for the first one. So people can't do too much damage. Um, so they're just protecting against those departments who you know, don't really know that there's going to be an impact by, by including more scripts on there. And then the final thing I want to leave you with is just to remember that you have leverage. Um, I've seen brands spend seven figures a year on third parties. Um, and that means that they can go and speak to them. You can go and speak to their account managers and get in touch with their tech teams and try and work with them to actually improve this. Because ultimately, if you improve it, it's not just your company who's going to benefit. If they improve something that rolls out there across their entire platform, everyone wins. If we go back to that report that Patrick Hulse um, produced, after he put it live, um, because it was a giant leaderboard of all these third parties and who's the worst and who's the best, um, Word Ads um, went out and actually optimized their performance and they took uh, their impact from an average of two and a half seconds down to just 200 milliseconds. So that's an immense benefit. Um, but the, the, the really key thing here is that it wasn't just one site that benefited from that. It was 32,000 websites that all of their clients you know, were embedding their, their tag on um, that benefited from their one optimization. So it's really important that you know, we do reach out to these third parties and try and work with them to improve it. So just to summarize, you don't make friends by taking toys away from the marketing department and sales and people like that. Um, so it's really important that we actually understand how they're using these tools. Um, you know, we can work on suggesting alternatives that may be more performant um, and trying to work with what we already have. Um, and optimize what we already have. Um, you should always assume that a third party is going to burn you at some point, especially if they use the phrase synchronous script. Um, that, that will harm you at some point. Um, they might have the best infrastructure in the world, but you know, even Amazon goes down at times. Um, so you, you do really need to protect yourself from them. And then ultimately, to leave on a kind of positive note, obviously if we work with these people and we can improve it, then we don't just improve it for ourselves and our own businesses, we improve it for everyone on the web. Um, so I think we can do a lot of good here. This is the URL to the slides. I've been Ryan Townsend. You can find me on Twitter and all the usual places. Um, if anyone has any questions, or I don't know whether we have time, but that's me. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Hello. Uh, thank you for presentation. And I have a question about uh, reducing unused uh, CSS and JavaScript. So uh, you are in e-commerce. Yeah. And uh, uh, sometimes you allow users to set up a content on a page. So some product carousels or mm -hmm. some banners and stuff. Uh, and uh, what uh, I faced uh, a while ago that we want to also just reduce the amount. But we had to put everything we had on one bundle because we uh, really didn't know what uh, really will happen on, on with the page because uh, user can, how, how uh, have you handled this situation somehow or uh, have some experience with uh, this kind of issue for reducing exactly unused stuff? Yeah, um, I mean, if you're pulling things in from third parties, that's a tricky one because as you say, you, you don't know what content there's going to be. Um, if, if, if they have any hooks or callbacks that you can hook into to know when certain things are loaded and maybe analyze maybe the HTML that they're returning, um, then that'll be useful, but that's gonna be heavily dependent on a third party. If it's just a, like a, a CMS or something like that and they have like a component system, um, one of the things that you can do is, is look at inlining some styles because you're gonna get that repetition down the page. Um, so if you have a component defining the styles with that component, and then that way, you know, with gzip, it'll just dedupe it all the way down. Um, but, uh, and the other thing that you can now do, I think Google Chrome might have fixed the bug where you can use individual style sheets for each component. Um, it was 
blocking the entire page due to HTTP2 prioritization, but now I think they have fixed that, so you could even extract those into individual style sheets and just have the third party include that job, that actual CSS with the component, maybe. That might be a way to do it. Cool, uh, great talk. Um, is it still, that's really loud, is it still um, uh, best practice to use sub-resource integrity with third parties? Uh, for security reasons or...? Yeah, I mean, this, this is the thing with CSP. It doesn't have a great deal of adoption because it's really hard to work with third parties and securing them down. Um, Sub-resource integrity is great if they never change the script. Um, as soon as they change it, obviously, it's just not going to load because your hash, your like security uh, signature, isn't going to match the downloaded file. Um, there are improvements in CSP now um, that make it a lot easier to work with third parties. So what you can do is you can whitelist the, just say it's one script that then pulls in 10 different scripts. I believe there's a thing called um, strict, I can't remember, strict something. Um, <laughs> um, it might be strict origin or something like that. Um, and basically what that says is I'm whitelisting this one file and anything that that then pulls in. Um, so you can then use the, the typical kind of nonce setup where you tag that file and say, here's the HTTP header that says, I've got a file with this tag on it. This is the, the actual tag, so I know I'm including it from that third party. Um, and then I'm allowing anything from th that they include to then be pulled in. But ultimately, you still have issues there where they could get hacked and you've got their content on your site, so you just have to lock down that third party. So if it is something that's really sensitive, the only thing to do is, is look at that sub-resource integrity and, and lock it down. But then you might as well, in a lot of cases, just first party that, because you know it's never going to change, so you might as well copy the code down, paste it into your project, or do it at build time. Um, and then that way you control it, you get better performance, um, and you know it's never going to change.